being good doesn't negate the fact that we live in a sinful, broken world. God did come to fix that. Now, we want him to fix our temporary stuff, but he, he fixed the, the most important thing for us, and that is our eternal destination, the brokenness of our soul. We know our destination, and that's heaven, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ. We're in Psalm 119 once again as we work our way through through the Psalm 119. So turn there in your Bibles. Psalm 119, uh, beginning in verse 121. And as we begin this, let's, uh, let me just start off with a word of prayer. Ask for God to bless it. Father, we come before you, Lord. We need some rain, Lord. I pray that you would bring rain to the farmers in this area, Lord, that, uh, we w- that you would bring the refreshing water from, from on high, Lord, that you would open up the faucet and give the farmers, Lord, some rain for their crops, Lord, to quench the ground. Lord, we know there's a lot of people depending on that, and I pray that you would do that, and we ask for you to do that, and we plead for you to do that, Lord. And I ask for some water to be poured out in the Holy Spirit tonight, Lord, that you'd anoint me with the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to preach your word, that your spirit would move as the word is preached, and you'd take these empty words, Lord, and that you'd fill them, and that you would deliver them to hearts, that you would speak to us this evening as we look at your word. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so here in Psalms 119, we've been going through it for a little while, and, and as just as a reminder, it, you know, it's a each uh, different, each eight verses starts with a different letter. So it's 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's acrostic, and so it, there's eight verses in each of the sections, and each of those verses start with that with a particular letter of that of that section, and the section we're looking at tonight is is one twenty one, and the letter is A. And if you have your Bibles and, and it has those letters in there, it says A. And so you know it's one twenty one, one twenty two, one twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight. All of them start with that little letter. We don't have it in Hebrew, so we don't see that. But that's that's what has set this this apart from. Uh, from the rest of them, and, and, and it's been, you know, it's very noticeable, uh, especially to the Hebrew, you know, as they learned uh, the, this, this psalm. And, and in the psalm, there's, there's eight also, so there's eight verses in each section. There's also eight different words, synonyms used for the Word of God in through here. So you, you'll find those all through here. So if you go back to 113, you, say, you know, it says, uh, you know, 119, verse 113, okay, it says, uh, law and word, and then commandments and word, and uh, we, you see uh, statutes, statutes. So the judgments is another one. Testimonies. You know, in Hebrew, there's eight different words and, and that they use, and, and that's used all the way through here. So that's why this is the psalm uh, talking about God's word and, and just the, the importance of God's word. And then the, the psalmist uses, starts each of those lines off with that certain letter just to, just to kind of add a little flair to it and, hap, and help people memorize, and it goes through the alphabet. But here in, verse, in verses 121 and 122 are the only two verses that is, there's no synonym for the Word of God. And there's various reasons for that, possibly. I don't know any of them. Uh, you, have, you, you, know, you have people that say it's, it's because he's, he's far from God at this point, or some people, you have, you have various... Um, Reasons we don't know why he just didn't do it in verses 121 and 122. Let, let, let me read through this and then we'll start back in verses 121. It says, I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the proud oppress me. My eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. That's when he starts using the synonyms. Deal with your servant according to your mercy and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right and hate every false way. As we look through this, we see some, key, we see some uh, various key words in this. We see that uh, a key word is servant. So the, the, uh, the servant is, is used in here three times. And then there, the key idea is this servant is being oppressed. So there's an oppress, oppression. If this is David writing this, which most people believe it is, but if David's writing this, then he's being oppressed by somebody and he is c- claiming himself to be a servant. And in, uh, verses, in verse 121, 
It says, he says, I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. So he's claiming that he, is, he, has, done, uh, he has done right. He has done, he has done what's right and what's, what's um, just. In your notes, I've also added the New Living Translation of the same line in there. So if you see it, you'll see the, the, the New King James and then New Living Translation. I just add in there, kind of give us a little extra angle on what is being said. The first point I have for you tonight on your, on your outline is this servant's prayer to the Lord is a prayer for God's protection, a prayer for God's protection. So he's praying, this is a prayer all through here that David's praying, and he's praying, number one, for, for God's protection, and he claims to have done justice and righteousness. And, and yeah, as I read the commentators and I look at the different people, you, uh, some say he's being arrogant in that, others say he's, he's not being arrogant in, in that, and, and I... I really believe that he is, he, is, he is telling the truth that he has been, he's being unjustly accused, or we would say falsely accused. So he's saying, I've done just, I've done right, and yet these, my oppressors are accusing me. They're accusing me that he, he's saying he's a good person, not that he, he deserves righteousness or deserves to, uh, this, uh, or he's trying to earn his salvation, so to speak. He's not basing it on his justness or his righteousness. He's just saying, I'm being falsely accused. I, I have, I've done something, and, and they're accusing me of this, and it's unjust that, uh, you know, I'm a good person. I did just and right. One of the questions that comes to mind from this is, you know, why do good people suffer? Why do good people suffer? That's one of the age-long question, right? Why do good why do bad things happen to good people? And that's just a very difficult, it's very difficult to answer that, sometimes impossible. Uh, but the answer really is in Genesis chapter 3, that sin came into the world, and because of sin, we have a mess on our hands that we're living in. A and there's, we, we can be as good as we can possibly be, but being good doesn't negate the fact that we live in a sinful, broken world. But God did come to fix that. Now, we want him to fix our temporary stuff, but he, he fixed the, the most important thing for us, and that is our eternal destination, that the brokenness of our soul. So there is, a, there is an answer to, you know, why do, if, if we were to say, you know, why do um, we go, you know, why, why are we not going to heaven? You know, God has, has fixed that for us. We can go to heaven through Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to have some bad things that happen to us while we walk on this temporary world, but we do know our destination and, that's, and that, is, that is heaven, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ. So why do people suffer? I don't, you know, I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tough. Sometimes we suffer because of, you know, stupid things we do. So sometimes we, we suffer because we did the wrong thing. You know, you, you, you hit your hand with a hammer. You know, some, nobody else did that. You know, I did that. So sometimes we do that or we, we, uh, we cause ourselves problems. But sometimes other people cause us problems. Some people, it's, it's, uh, it's satanic attack and causing us problems. But ultimately, it's because of sin and there's sin in the world, whether we do it to ourselves or somebody else does it, or whether it's a, a, an attack from the enemy. It's, it's ultimately, we live in a broken world. You know, it's, it's funny because people will, will, will when, when, th when bad things are happening, we always say, why does this thing happen to me? You know, you know, I've done this, and I've been good, and I've gone to church, or I've done... We list off, we try to list off the things that we've done, you know, that we don't deserve this. But you know, even bad people do the same thing. Even bad people don't think they deserve what they're getting. I mean, very, every now and then you'll run into somebody that says, you know what, I, de I deserve that. And sometimes we'll even come to that point. But, but even, even people who we would say, that person, that, that's a bad person, they, would, they think they're getting the raw end of the deal. I mean, you can watch, you know, court TV all day long or watch the, you know, 48 hours and, and there's people that are being sentenced for things that they've done that are thinking they're being unjustly sentenced. So, so here he's being falsely accused. He's being falsely accused. He's done nothing wrong. Have you ever been in that point where, you, where somebody's accusing you falsely? Man, we get fired up when somebody accuses us falsely, don't we? When somebody tells us that we've done something wrong, you know, you, you, know, you stole... You know, you stole ten dollars from me. How dare you tell me I stole ten dollars from you? I only, you know, we may only stole seven from them, but they're unjustly, they're, but but they're but they're unjustly accusing us, right? So you know, so we 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 are being accused of something that that we didn't do. Now we have plenty to that we can be accused of. 
I was listening to a, a pastor uh, uh, preach through this as I was preparing for it, and he was, he's, a, he's a famous pastor, and he was talking to another pastor, another famous pastor on the phone, that they were both being accused of something. Um, they never said what it was, but they didn't do it. And the one, so they start, after their conversation, one pastor was praying for them, and he, said, he prayed, and he said, uh, thank you, Lord, that, we're, that uh, we're being accused of something that we didn't do, because there are plenty of things that we have done that we could be accused of, and they're not accusing of any of those things. And isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth, that there's so many things that I can be, can be accused of, but I'm... But, this, when they happen to choose something that I didn't do, it's a delight, is it not? To, if somebody chooses something that we didn't do, it's a rarity in our lives many times. But, but even if you know, a husband or a wife accuses somebody or something, we know if they didn't accuse us exactly of what we did, we, you know, we, 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 we really wrench back, we, we fight back. You know, how dare you accuse me of that? And it, 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 wasn't, thi- you know, it wasn't this, it was this. You know, we falsely accuse. We have the desire to defend ourselves. You know, we immediately want to go into defense mode. And that's just, you know, you know you, 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 you're accusing me. Well, let me tell you something about you. That's the first thing that comes to our mind, right? We, want, we, we start the attack back. Let me, let me tell you, you know, if your boss wants to tell you something you're doing wrong, well, we got plenty of things to tell our boss about that they do wrong, you know? And, they start, and the first thing that happens is, is our mind starts going to those things. It starts, you know, you, know you, you want to accuse me of something? I've got, I've got as much on you as, as you have on, on me. But that, that started in the Garden of Eden also, because when, after, the, after uh, the fall, after Adam and Eve sinned, you know, the, the, ac- the accusations, you know, started flying, that, you know, God came, and, and it, you know, it's the woman that you gave me, and the woman said, it's the, it's the serpent that did it, so we, we always pass the buck. We always, you know, how dare you accuse me, we pass it on. Or when you're falsely accused, it's, it is kind of, when, when, when you're the one falsely accusing, isn't it, isn't it, kind of, isn't it embarrassing when you're in that situation? And, and, or when you, when you uh, falsely accuse your spouse of putting something somewhere, you know, where did you put my, I'm always doing this because my wife likes to tuck things and I like to keep things all over the place, you know what I mean? And so uh, I can be right some of the times, but then other times, you know, what did you do with my book? I know you put it away somewhere, you know, and then I find out that I put it somewhere. Oh man, that really, you know, you really... That's, that's, that's egg on the face right there when you falsely accuse somebody. Uh, and that's what's happening here. Somebody's falsely accusing. I know when we had a restaurant, Big Boy Drive-In, and another in, in Kansas City, and it's just a mom and pop store, and we had the name Big Boy, and it's Big Boy Boogers Incorporated is the trademark on it. And um, another uh, Shoney's Big Boy came into town, and they immediately fired off a letter to us to tell us to take our name down, that we were using it illegally. And they had checked with the state of Missouri to see if we had a trademark, and, and the state of Missouri said we didn't. But they had misplaced our, they had, when they'd gone digital, they had misplaced our trademark. We did have one. And uh, so we, they're accusing us, and man, how dare you accuse us? We got our trademark, and we got our lawyers, and we, you know, we, we shot back at them. And $10,000 later, we, uh, all, we, nothing, nothing was accomplished. We just spent $10,000 accusing them, and it was, it was expensive. We got nothing, nothing out of them. But when, when, they, when somebody accuses you, you accuse them back. As a matter of fact, that Shoney's went out of business later on, and when they're showing it on, Can, on KCTV5, um, they're saying the Shoney, it was right before Christmas, and they were saying Shoney's went out of business, and, they, um, and the employees, it was kind of a sad deal because the employees are now, you know, are, are losing their jobs right before Christmas. And whose sign were they showing on the news? Boy, they were showing our sign right there, you know. And I was like, okay, that's great. So we're getting the car phone is, run, is ringing off the hook that we're closing our business. And no, we're not closing our business. And it was another one of those kind of, you know, it was a mess up, false accusation. So what they, they, ran a, uh, they ran something later on in the news saying that they were, you know, that they, it was incorrect, but it still didn't, it's, we still had to put an answering machine on, you know, saying that we're still in business, you know, come in. But that falsely accused, he's being falsely accused, but God is our defender. He's calling for God really to, to don't leave me to my oppressors. I have done just, I have done right, do not leave me to my oppressors. He's asking God to defend him. He's asking God to, to, to protect him. And, it, and that's where we have to come to when, when we are being oppressed, when somebody attacks us, that it's so hard to allow God to be our defender. We want to defend ourselves. 
We want to get on social media and start, you know, get on Facebook and start lashing out and start saying things and start, and start defending ourselves or start making it look like uh, to, to get people to, to feel for us or to be mad at the other person we're mad at. And uh, that does not help. The, the Lord can, can, does not need our help in defending us with social media. Uh, he's, he's good at doing that. We, we, we tend, if, if we take over his job, then he'll let us have that, and, he will not, and then we've done our defense ourselves. God is our protect, protection. He's crying out to, for, for God to not leave him to his oppressors. And then in the next verse, in verse uh, 122, it says, Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the proud oppress me. Uh, be surety for your servant. The, the point here is prayer for promise. He's praying, the servant's praying, and he's praying for promise. Promise or you know, covenant, surety, uh, guarantee. He's asking, is, you know, he's asking God, say, be, you know, you, keep your promise that for your servant and don't allow the proud to oppress me, to come up against me. Uh, you know, one of the commentators was saying that this, this is possibly one that you could say that he's not using a synonym for the word of God, but he's, but he's calling on God's surety, God's promise here in this, this word that's being used here, uh, translated guarantee in the New Living Translation, or surety and covenant in other you know, translations. But basically, you know, a, a contract, back in, in these, in these uh, ancient days, you didn't have these contracts like we have, we buy a house or buy something, man, you're... you're, you're filling out all kinds of paperwork because they, they want to hold you to a contract. You, you want to hold them to a contract and, and us to a contract. So there's a lot of, of papers that need to be signed. But many times it was just a verbal contract or something passing, or they would do it in front of the elders or leaders of, of, the, of the city or the, of the tribe or the area so that you have other people hearing what's going on. There's a transaction being, being taken place so that the, the elders will hold each party to their part of the bargain, whatever that is. And, and God is, is, is our surety, he's our guarantee, he's our covenant, he has, he has made the contract on, on us to protect us, to care for us if we're his children, but really even for our salvation, he, he has made a, he's, he's our, he's made a contract for our salvation. Here we, we see he uses the word servant, so now he, he's, he's placing himself as a servant to, the, to, a, to, the, to God. You know, God is, our, is his master, so we are the servant if we're placing ourselves in this psalm, and God is our master. It's a, it's a servant-master relationship. You know, God is a good master, though. He, he treats us well. You know, we, so the, the, the contract between them is the contract between, between uh, master and servant. God will protect that servant. You know, we, we serve him. He protects us. He cares for us. He feeds us. He houses us that he is a good master to us if we are a good servant to him. Are we, are we serving him well? You know, what kind of servant are we? What kind of servant are we to, to the Lord? Are we selfish servant or an unselfish servant? Are we a lazy servant or a hardworking servant? Are we obedient servant or disobedient servant? God is still a good master no matter what. He, he still holds to his contract, but we reap better benefits or we have a better relationship a, as a result of being a good servant. You know, God is our guarantee. If he has an, uh, when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, that there, that there is a contract, in essence, between God and us, that we have enacted a contract, that he gave his son, that he's paid the price. The price for my sins are paid for. When I, enter, when I stand at the gates of heaven and, and I uh, ask to go in, I'm able to enter in because, of what, because Jesus Christ paid for my sins. The contract is really easy on our part. We have to uh, ask Jesus, to, we, we have to submit ourselves to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And he pays, he pays our, our entrance. And so the, on, the contract on that is, God, is God's the only one that, that can uh, break that, and he, doesn't, and he chooses not to. It's an unconditional uh, covenant. There's no conditions on that. Once we enact that covenant by trusting in Jesus Christ our Savior, it's unconditional. God will honor that contract, and we will enter into heaven because the price has been paid. If it's up to us, we're going to mess things up. 
We, we can't keep that contract, but God can. And he's saying, be surety for your servant. You know, be, you know, we see that in so many different ways with God, how he honors and how he guarantees the things in our life. We trust, we see also that um, he says here, don't, uh, don't let the proud oppress me. Don't let the proud oppress me. That, that there's, there's pride. The, the oppression comes in because of the pride of the oppressor. Are we prideful? Do we oppress people? Who are we oppressing because of our pride? That uh, the, the, the oppressors to David or to the psalmist was, was putting the pressure on him, and he's asking for God to protect him, to move, for him to, to, to step in. And he was trusting in God's work, trusting in God's control. You know, we have our part, and our part is to do what God's commanded us to do, and God's, God will come through on his part. He, when in, in um, witnessing, we, we are just to share the good news. But God has his part, which is to enact that in the, in the person's heart, to draw them, to, open, to take the veil off their eyes, to, allow, to uh, deliver that word to the heart. When Mark preaching on Sunday morning, he's, it's just wonderful going through um, Sam, 1 Samuel, and as he preaches, the Holy Spirit delivers messages to each person's heart as we, as, as we hear the, the word being preached. You know, God has his work, God, God does the work, God is in control, and we cannot manipulate those things. We need to allow God to do the work, God to do the work. Look at the next verse, verse 123. It says, my eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. Now the, now the synonyms start coming in. My eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. The third one is a prayer of weariness, a prayer of weariness, weariness. Here he's waiting, he's waiting on God to come through. He's waiting for salvation or, or rescue in essence. You know, not, not, not uh, salvation of his soul, but salvation of him from his oppressors. And he's, he is, uh, he's getting weary from waiting on God and, and, and from his, the righteous word, from the truth, from the, the promise of his word. And this just a, a waiting for justice can, be a, can, can seem long. Waiting on God can seem a long time. Waiting on God to answer our prayers can seem very long. Waiting on anything is is very difficult. And in our fast society, in American society, in our fast, you know, going to Sonic and sitting in the drive through can seem like forever sometimes, right? It's just, you know, it's just, uh, we, we are very impatient people in waiting. And, um, you know, but here he, he's, he is, he's tired. Um, life can be tired. You know, life can just, it's just be, you get tired of the grind of life, of, of, of tough things. That's why church is so important. If, if you don't have, if you, there's so many people who get just beaten down and they're not in church and then finally they get beat up enough that they finally come back into church and, and, and you've got to have, you, you know, the, the, if you don't get the, some mess, hear from the Holy Spirit and, and hear from the word and be around other believers and, and be able to praise God, it's such an important thing to do as often as we can. And that's the importance about church is to get out of the world and in with believers and allow, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts and maybe hear something when we're, we come in and we're ticked and we don't want to forgive somebody because we're just, we're just mad. And then we hear a message and the message is, no, no, Jeff, you need, you, you need, to, you need to forgive or you need to you do whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do. And, and that's an adjustment in our life. We'll have the Holy Spirit to make an adjustment in our life and to work in our heart and life. And if we're not in church or not around God's word, it's probably not going to happen. Those adjustments aren't going to happen, and then we get, we get farther and farther and farther away from where we need to be. And if we're going, just each week, we you know we get off off base a little bit. We come in and we get dialed back in, and we get dialed back in. That's why our daily devotions are so important to hear from God and, and to dial us in each day to what God wants us to do. But here He's weary. Waiting is difficult. I remember when we were missionaries in, in Central America, and we were we were traveling through borders. You know, um, I don't believe in purgatory, but if, if there is, it's, it's the borders of Central America, I can tell you that. And um, you get caught there, man, and it lasts for a long time. And I remember we were going from, we were going from Nicaragua to Costa Rica, and I bet, I don't know if it was six or eight hours we were in there, but it seemed like you know, six weeks, you know, and, and just waiting in a line to go through, and, and, to, and a line of probably 400 people to get checked through this, this uh, just 
you know, hot and jungly and nobody cares and people, it's just, it's just you know, it's, it's really, it was just a nightmare. And six hours, you know, it doesn't even sound, I needed to say 16 or something because six, it seems like forever, you know what I mean? It'd be like, picture setting six hours in the sonic drive through or something like that, I don't know, but, uh, you know, standing, it, it's just, it was just a long time and, and waiting is so difficult, it's just so, so difficult, it's weariness of, of soul. And, and that's for us, I think, you know, here is uh, the weariness of soul is, is maybe it's when life doesn't turn out the way you planned. I was listening to one of the pastors and he had a great point where he's talking about sometimes weariness of soul is you're praying for something, you're looking for something to happen in your life and it just doesn't turn out the way you planned. Are you okay with that? If God's in control, are you okay with that? That's a weariness of soul of praying for something that, that you, know, you, you, you know, maybe you never got married or, or you never got the job or you never got the house or you never got the retirement, you know, or you had a handicapped child or an untimely death of a loved one. Maybe those, those, those things happen and you're, it's just weary, you know, why did this happen to me and, and, and makes life very difficult. And he used some different examples. He talks about, he used one that I never thought of before, but he talked about Esther. You know, Esther, you know, uh, rose up and she became, you know, a princess or a queen, you know, she became a queen and saved her people, the Jewish people. But he made a point saying that, you know, I bet her dream never was to marry a pagan king and, and be in some harem that maybe never saw the king ever again. But, but maybe her dream as a little girl was to be a queen, but have a, maybe have a Jewish husband and to have a, or just to be a, have a, have a, a nice husband and kids and, and live in the house and, 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 and grow, see the kids grow up. Did she have kids? Did she not have kids? You know, what were, or, or we don't, you know, what was her life like as part of a harem? You know, so what, she gave those dreams away and received that and walked into it because that's what God had called her to do. Or Joseph, where you see Joseph is, you know, what was he dreaming of when he had his coat of many colors and, and uh, he was out in the, in the fields and with his brothers and they sell him into slave, slavery and uh, he goes off to Egypt and then he's in jail and, and he's thinking, this is, this is ridiculous. You told him, he, he thought he heard from the Lord that he was going to be a ruler of somehow. And he ended up, he, but that weariness is that time before it happens, or Job and his life. But sometimes it just never happens. Maybe, that, maybe he would have stayed in jail. Maybe he would have been unjustly accused and spent his whole life in jail, and that happens. Those things happen. It's weariness of soul. It's asking, seeking, God, please move, waiting for God to move, waiting for God's justice, and, and, and receiving it in God's time, and... In Isaiah 40, verse 31, um, it says, um, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not fade. That we're waiting on the Lord. If you wait on the Lord, your strength will be renewed. So wait on the Lord, not wait on that vengeance, or wait on that person to fall, or wait on, on, on those things to have. Wait on the Lord. The fourth thing we see is in, is in 124. It says, deal with your servant according to your mercy, according to your mercy, um, and uh, teach me your statutes. Fourth thing is prayer for mercy, prayer for mercy. He's asking for mercy. He uses the word servant again. So if I was to underline key words in this, I'd underline servant, mercy, teach, statutes. You know, so so he's, once again, he uses servant, and a servant, why? Because a servant is, is totally dependent on mercy. A servant of a master is totally dependent on the mercy of his master. And if we're a servant of the Lord, we're totally dependent on the mercy of our master, and that's God. That we're, they're, they're, a, a true servant doesn't have any say. They're, they're, it's, it's, their, it's their master that makes all, calls all the shots. But we have a good master, right? We have a, a, good, a good master, and, but we're, we are at his mercy. You know, servants are at the mercy of their master. You know, we're, are we at the mercy of God, or what, are you, what do you live to the, at the mercy of? Are you at the mercy of money? Are you at the mercy of fame? The mercy of self? The, you know, we need to be at the mercy of God because he's the one who is going to show mercy. Money doesn't show mercy. There's no mercy there. You know, fame doesn't show mercy. Self doesn't show mercy, but God does. You know, mercy is don't give me what I deserve, don't give me what I deserve. Give me mercy. Give me what I don't deserve, 
and that, uh, something better. And then he says, teach me. So now he's in, a, he's in a position of submission. He says, teach me your statutes. So he's, uh, he's a servant uh, at the master's mercy, and he's asking to be taught. To, he's being submissive. He's in a position where he can learn. And that's where we need to be, where God sometimes grabs us and places us into a position and, where we need his mercy, and now we can learn from him because when we're prideful and arrogant and we don't need God, we don't learn. You, just, you, pride, you ever try to tr- teach somebody who, who knows everything? It's very difficult. You know, um, you know, when I was 16, I knew everything. I, you know, my dad didn't teach me a whole lot. And so you know, so when we, somebody who knows everything is not going to learn anything. That's why, that's why we need to be a servant at his mercy. The next, um, next verse, in verse 125, says, I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Number five is a prayer for understanding God's word. A prayer for understanding God's word. He, once again, he uses the word servant. This is the third time. This is, makes it a theme through here. Servant, understanding, no testimonies. That's the key words there. So servant and understanding, no testimonies. Once again, the servant, he's shown his humility, understanding, not just teach me, but now he's receiving from that teaching. He's humbled himself. He's put himself in a position to learn, and now he's understanding. And understanding God's word is that it's clicking. The light's popping on. There's a depth to God's word. You know, life experience really opens up God's word to us. Sometimes tough times or life situations bring us uh, open up God's word that we can understand the meaning of, of that. And sometimes understanding God has to bring us to a point uh, or break us or put us, uh, break us down to where he, we can understand what, what he wants to teach us. And tough times uh, seem to be those in my life where I do most of my learning. And for most of us, it's the same, the same way, that difficult times in our life, whether we bring them on ourselves or whether there's circumstances that come upon us, is when we, our ears open up a little bit and I wake up and I say, God, speak to me. I want to hear from you. Or I lay myself down at night and I say, Lord, speak to me tonight. Just speak to me and, and I want to hear from you. And I'll go to sleep and I'll ask God. I, nearly every night I ask God for to speak to me as I lay down to go to sleep and uh, I want to hear from him. I want him to speak to me. I want, I, I want to... Now, I can't say that I've always done that. Before, I think, you know... And even now, God sometimes drives me into that. In, he has to open my ears because I cannot hear when I think I've got it all together. The, the sixth, uh, sixth thing is, is found in verses 126. It, it is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. This is prayer for God to move, prayer for God to move. Here he's asking God, you know, I don't know if he's being arrogant in this or he's just saying, you know, telling God what to do or he's just saying, it's time, Lord, please. I think that's probably the more accurate one. Please, God, it's time for you to act. You know, you, you see kind of three, you see, um, three people working in this psalm, okay? You see the psalmist working. Versus in, in the first two verses we looked at, this, there's a guy who had a theory on this, that I, and he talked about that, that the psalmist was doing the work in verses in 121 and 122. That's why you don't see the Word of God there. I'm not sure I believe that, but it sounded good. And then you see the oppressor working, working against the, the, the psalmist, and now he's asking God to work. So you see the psalmist working, the oppressor working, and now God, I need you to work. God, God working. He's asking God to act. He, he's... Um, for they have regarded your law as void. It's time, it's time to fulfill your promise. Protect the innocent. Defend the, the vulnerable. And so there is a time for God to act, and he acts in his time. But there's a time for us to act also. And a time for us to act is to respond to God's word, to do what is right, to, to, to listen to God and to be prompted by God and to follow what he tells us to do. And, and then the, uh, the last... The last one, uh, seventh one is found in verses 127 to 128, and it says, um, Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way. Number seven is prayer of valuing God's word. Prayer of valuing God's word. So, he, so we're underlying key things, love commandments. Um, you see, um, he, he, he loves the word. 
He is more than gold, more than fine gold. You know, it's a phrase, yes, but it, it, you know, do we really do we do we love this more than money? You know, what is the God's word worth to us? We really probably wouldn't know that unless we unless God's word was taken away from us, because you don't know what you got till it's gone, right? So, and we if God's word was taken away, then we would know the value of God's word. You know, we don't really. It's really impossible for us to know the true value of God's word, having so many of them in our house, on our phone, in our bookshelves, that we have it. But is we, the way we live shows our value for the word of God. Do we, do, we, do we live what it says? Do we obey what it says? Do we believe that if we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, that God will save us? Do I really believe that when I stand at the gates of heaven that I'll be able to enter in based upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Well, I believe that God is a truth teller because he does it over and over again in, his word of God, in the word of God. He's told the truth this time and this time and this time and this time. So when, I, when, when he tells me to trust in Jesus Christ, he's telling the truth once again. He's a truth teller. Do we value the word of God? I think hopefully the older we get, the more we understand life, the more we understand the word, the more we will value God's word. And God's word is, is, is so important. It's the only piece of truth that we have. We have so much media nowadays, this thing gets kind of lost. But you know, 800 years ago, when there wasn't a lot of books, when there wasn't a lot of writings, when there wasn't a lot of media, Man, this thing, this, this looked huge to people. They saw how important this book was and how, and how influential it was and how, much, how wise it was. But we have been inundated with so many books and movies and media and, and internet that it, this thing gets, it gets drowned out. The white noise drowns out uh, how important the Bible is to us. And so if we... If, if, Satan can't discredit it and get rid of it, then maybe he can devalue it. So what is the value of God's word to us? Is it valuable enough to look at every day? And you don't have to sit down and read it. Just read a verse a day. Just read a verse a day and ask God to speak to you through that verse. Is, what is the value of God's word? Well, this servant, David, had a prayer to the Lord. He was being oppressed, and his prayer... Um, he was asking God to move, and I ask God, we ask as a staff God to move in our church. We ask God to, to come and to, to move in our hearts and lives, and I believe God is moving. And just today, we had 10 people join the church from our new members, so that's, you know, that's a praise, and God's doing, doing great things, and we ask that he would continue to move through his word and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray as we come to sing one more song. Father, we just thank you for your goodness and your grace and your love and your mercy. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for your love. I thank you, Lord, for Pastor Mark and, and how you have anointed him to, to preach to us, Lord, and, and how you put this staff together, Lord, and how we work well together and, and how we love you and we love your word. And Lord, I pray for a blessing upon this church that you would bless us in, in a way, Lord, not with ne numbers necessarily or might, but that you would bless us with believers that are deep in the word, that you would unlock your word for us and to us. Lord, I pray for miracles, that you would heal people physically. Lord, that you would heal marriages, that you would heal hearts, that you would heal people caught in sin, that you would heal people, Lord, uh, spiritually that uh, are seeking you. Lord, that you, that you would draw those who don't know you so that we'd see souls saved and that we'd see people baptized each week, Lord. That we, what we want is for you to move in Topeka and for you to do what we cannot do, and that's to save souls and change lives. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray that you'd be glorified. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.